Welcome to my sewing room. I'm so glad you could come visit today. Now, I bet most of you have heard of knife pleats, haven't you? That, that's been around a long time. But have you ever heard of fork pleats? That's what our show is all about today. The first example I would like to share with you of fork pleats is my beautiful little doll, Cecil Elizabeth. She has on a wonderful little dropped waist dress with ribbon down the front, lace down the front, all kinds of embellishment, and a perky little bow. But if you'll look at the pleats on her dress, those are fork pleats. And a little bit later on, we're going to share with you just how easy it is to do fork pleats. Let me share with you another fork pleated skirt. This skirt is fork pleated and the inverted pleats in the middle are stitched down. That's for a very flattering look since it goes kind of flat over a tummy. Here is another example of fork pleated skirt. This one has just the simple fork pleats that go all the way around the top. None of these have been stitched down. This is a wonderfully flattering skirt with a straight waistband and then fork pleats that come down below the, the elongated waistband. Even an example of fork pleats on a beautiful little child's dress. Let me hold the collar up just a little bit so you can see the fork pleats on the little girl's silk dupioni dress. And one of the things I really would like to share with you is at the bottom of this dress, the hem has been put in with a double needle built-in machine scallop. What a beautiful way and a very simple and easy way to finish the hem of a skirt. Very fancy and very pretty, but also very easy. And now then, I have a very special guest, Patty Jo Larson, who is the inventor of fork pleating. And I'm going to have her share with you exactly what this new technique is all about. I am so excited to have as my guest today my very close friend, Patty Jo Larson, who happens to be one of the most talented designers and inventors in the whole world. I never know what she's going to come up with next. Today, I would like to say hello and welcome to the show, Patty Jo. Thank you again having, for having me, Martha. <laughs> now, I want to show the, our viewers one more time this gorgeous little dress, this fork pleating. I just, it's so much fun. This little dress has total machine embroidery. And since Patty Jo is a Husqvarna educator, it was done on the Husqvarna Viking. And let me just show you these pleats again. Oh my goodness, those, I just can't wait to see those fork pleats. And this is Joanna's third birthday dress, is that right? Now then, the sleeves even have those fabulous fork pleats. And you know what I just love? The fork pleats are there in all their glory, and then a beautiful machine embroidery done in a pretty pink shiny thread is right on top of it. Now I'm going to quit talking and turn this fork pleating thing over to you, Patty. There's Show. nothing to it, Martha, and I really can't take full credit. I was teaching a school, I was teaching a, a one-hour skirt class at the Ribbon Room in Memphis, Tennessee, when I learned this technique from one of my students. She just had to share it with me, and I've, I've shared it with so many people. You simply start, before you sew your skirt to your waistband, you just start at the edge of the fabric, slip your fork in, I turn just, the fabric one, around. One tie in. You only need one tie in. What you get, what you end up with is the perfect space or the perfect width pleat. Every time, it's the same width. And a regular table fork will give you an inch pleat. So if you flip it over after you've stuck it in the edge of the fabric, I, I surge the edge of the dupioni first because it tends that to crazy ravel. Stuff is so ravelly. Right. I just love it, but you do need to surge it. And so if you want them spaced so that they're an inch apart and an inch deep, now, you, you just butt one right into along the other. A little bit to you can out exactly slip them if you wanted to start over here with your fork and then flip it over. You can slide it back. Oh. So you can get okay. it in the right place. Okay. You can mark how far apart. If you wanted to space your pleats further apart than what, you know, butting it right to the next one would be, then you can mark how far apart they are. But this will give you even pleats every every oh, pleat. That is absolutely I'll tell you what happened after I learned this. We were doing one hour skirt classes and I talked about how it's nice to have the inverted pleat at the tummy. You can flip it over and you end up with a box pleat. But if you um, get to the center of your skirt, what I was doing was having um, making a skirt, you just start with a, a with your fabric, start at your side seam, pleat until you're at the center of your waist, okay. and then take this and flip it the other way. 
So now you have an inverted pleat at the oh, center. Pat, okay, do that so one more time. So you sew your skirt after you. Do that you, one more time. Okay, okay these right I was flipping this way. Okay. And then this one I'm flipping back that way. So I have an inverted. My goodness. And you know, that is very flattering. It's more at the flattering center, at, at the, the center. Line, and yeah. then you would pleat over to your other side seam. And you can gather the back of the skirt or continue to pleat all the way around. But if you sew the waistband on afterwards, you can make your skirt pleated it without any pattern. Oh my and goodness. that's what and we you were know doing. What a nightmare commercial patterns are. Fold here, turn here. Yeah, all those marks. <laughs> marks, marks, I know. <laughs> marks, marks. Marks, Too but many you marks. just so so I was finding that I've done so many pleated skirts because the ladies would buy the fabric at the store and I'd pleat it up for them and they'd take it home and sew the waistband on. That because it was so easy. All you had to have this person standing there so you could see how far to go to their middle. Isn't that great, Martha? <laughs> it is. And I just want to show you on, on another skirt I okay. did how, how more flattering this inverted pleat is to be in the center than what a box pleat would be because this looks like you're going upstairs to the center of your tummy. That's not and good. And that's not good. <laughs> it's better to go downstairs and, and, and then it doesn't look as rounded. So that was a nice little tip. Uh, if you have different sized forks, you can make big pleats for home deck so okay. you can get a serving fork. Okay. You can use a hair pick. You can, you use, can use a, a cocktail picture. fork. <laughs> if you want a little bitty plate for dog clothes. Yes. Well, you know what? That sounds right. Should I okay. show the sleeve? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see that sleeve. The sleeve is just another uh, part of the dress that I used pleats on. After I did the embroidery, well, I, I wanted a now, smaller hey. pleat, so I used a plastic fork with one fine, with one tine cut out. And so you can just And you hope it, it doesn't break. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's strong enough. So that's all there is to well, it. Well, go ahead and do that for me. Let okay. me see what, how that works. So you just, after the embroidery's there and you want to center it with the So you the did the embroidery first, mm -hmm. of course. I did the embroidery first on a block of fabric, cut the sleeve out later, and then see after you get it done, you'll have it all pleated up like this. Again, I just spaced these a width of the, the fork away. After the sleeve was hemmed is when I pleated this one. But typically, if you're doing a waist of the dress or of a or of a skirt you're going along a raw edge with the fork but if on the bottom of the sleeve i thought it was nicer to have it hemmed first and okay. then do the pleat and do later. one more pleat then you'll have it done and then you just just sew it straight right and then the the bottom of the sleeve Oops. is finished that's right okay well. maybe turn it in the right direction huh? yeah now <laughs> i'm now i'm confused there we go <laughs> and then if you want to stitch it up the sewing machine that would be the last step. And your hem, your the bottom of the sleeve is complete at that mm -hmm. point. You don't have to do anything else, do you? Oh, Patty Jo, that is so exciting. And now we have a beautiful ladies' nightgown with, you guessed it, knife. I, I, I said it wrong. <laughs> Fork, please. <laughs> We have a beautiful nightgown that is so pretty and it's made out of a linen cotton blend that it really kind of looks like a sundress or a patio dress to me. Patty Jo made this beautiful gown and first of all she started with a beautiful embroidered motif and here are those fork pleats underneath. The embroidery is just as beautiful on the bottom of the gown as it is on the top and I really would like to pull it up so you can see that this beautiful embroidery goes all the way around the bottom of the gown and then there's a beautiful wing needle hem stitch that actually puts in the hem. Now Patty Jo, I think you said you have some exciting techniques to share with us. I think I do Martha <laughs> and I was so glad that you designed some beautiful big embroideries that can be used like on the collar. I guess you'd call it a little collar on, like your, the one I have on, on your dress. <laughs> so I used uh, your stitch number three on, on your Cardo 102 and um, once you have it embroidered, then you remove it from the hoop. I would like to give a little tip about cutting out an embroidery right next to the satin stitch. Oh, yeah. Sort of like a cut work, but it's more of the edging. And I like to tear away the stabilizer and then use a seam sealant. But um, I just thought this might be helpful to the viewers. If you put the seam sealant right on the back of the thread that you just stitched, sometimes it wicks up into the design itself and you, you can see it on certain colors. So instead, just go ahead and put your seam sealant out here where you're going to do the trimming away. And then that will dry and, and um, it'd be real easy to cut. Just put it on the outside rather than on the design. What you're cutting okay. away is where okay. you put it, right. And that works really good. You can press it to, to speed the drying and then when you trim it away, um, then your edge is all finished and you don't have to worry That's about it. That's called very carefully, right? Yes, <laughs> good scissors. Now after you've made your little um, collar, I'll show you how to fork pleat the top of the the gown. And this one didn't have, it was meant to be gathered, but it just I just marked the center. And if you just want to use the fork instead of gathering, you can just start at the center, place your first pleat, 
by flipping your fork, and I'll do inverted pleats to the center, and then place your second one. There's a bit of a slight curve to this neckline, so you just slant that one, pin that right there, and then on the other side, you face it toward the other way. So you put your fork in this way and flip it towards you. And then just eyeball the space from the center snip that you see there. So it's very fast to just fork pleat up the top of this nightgown, or if you call it a nightgown or a sundress. So once you flip these two over, then you've pleated the whole top of your dress. You can check it to see if it's accurate simply by folding it in half to see that your pleats line up, and they do. And then what I did, the next step was stay stitch it so that all of the, ple all of the pleats then um, will be held in place for the finishing edge of the, of the gown. And so stay stitching goes very quickly to just pull the pins out as you go. <laughs> now my French bias piping is what I'm really excited okay. to share with you. Okay. That's how I finish the top edge of this um, after you stay gown. Stitch. After you stay okay. stitch your pleats in place, then you would lay your little um, tab thing that you made from the embroidery and you'd put your straps in. But the piping, now if you've ever made piping before, uh, typically you just use a wide enough piece of bias to cover your cord, which is like an inch for this size cord. So normal piping, made or boughten, has two raw edges. Is that right, Martha? Exactly. So if you use it for a finish on the top of something, you're not really going to be pleased with the inside because it'll be a raw edge. Yep. But this piping that I've decided is just wonderful for all your heirloom sewing, and I just use it all the time, I call French bias piping, starting with a two-inch strip of fabric rather than a one-inch strip. The first step is to press or, or baste the fabric strip in half. So your bias strip starts out twice as wide as you need it, fold it and either press it or baste it in half. And this, uh, that's why I call it French bias because it's like your French bias binding. That's the first step. Then make your piping like you normally would make piping by placing the cord in the center, folding your fabric over the cord, and if you have a piping foot on your sewing machine, you'll certainly use it because it has a groove in the bottom that helps guide it perfectly over the cord. And I like the little shish kebab stick too to help feel my way along while I'm stitching the piping. Now what you have is a folded edge and two raw edges, and your cord is covered with a double layer of fabric. Okay. Okay, then what you do is, and I'll show you here, take it out. Um, you trim away the two raw edges and they won't be seen. And then what you have next to the piping is a folded finished edge. There's a basting there you see. But so you have piping that can be put in as a facing. Right, so I'll lay, it, I'll lay it along the top of the, of the gown here to show you. When you lay in piping, always the same way, you, you line up your raw edges, the cords in, the seam allowance away, you stitch, and then when you turn it to the inside, after you trim away the, the bulk of the fabric, you'll have this wonderful finished edge. It's like show a binding. Show me one more second. Turn that back over and I'll let's stitch see. This. Okay. Use your piping foot to stitch. You just trimmed away the raw edges underneath. Trim away the raw edges of your, of your okay. seam allowance. Okay. So this would be like the underarm seam. You would have all of your straps in your other thing. Okay. Sew it into your garment. Trim away the seam allowance. And also the other little two raw edges that were trimmed away from the piping are under there as well. So when you press this to the inside of your gown, once all this is trimmed away, it's like you have a binding. Absolutely beautiful. A finished binding. Oh my goodness. You don't have to use facing or lining or binding. This is absolutely piping and one What step. is the name again? French bias piping. French I made bias, it up. I don't French know. Bias I just figured that's a thing to call it. I think that's a wonderful name. Thank you so much, Patty Jo. And next we have a home decorating project for you. I absolutely love this pink table runner. It would be so wonderful to put right down the middle of your pretty white tablecloth for a bridal shower, I think. This table runner is so pretty. It has the two motifs on it and the wing needle entredeau or the hem stitching actually hems the whole thing. It's a long table runner. Let me show you how easy it is to make this one. First of all, you get two motifs. You can buy that at any uh, place that sells kind of bridal things. And let me show you first of all how we're going to fold it. So easy to do. Simply make a fold down one side, a fold down the end, and then fold it over into a triangle and pin it. And let me show you how we're going to get this sewing done. 
First of all, I'm going to spray on, I'm going to spray on this little glue that's going to come away later. This, it really isn't a glue, it's a, golly, temporary spray adhesive is what it's called. So I'll put those on in the place. And then I'm going to do my wing needle entredeau only on the places where this does not show. Then I'm going to go back in and just simply straight stitch around. Now there are several tricks for wing needle entredeau and I'd like to share some of those tricks with you right now. First of all, you let the machine do all the work. I've always said you keep your hands in front as if you're playing a concert piano. You do not do any pulling. I don't put my hands behind it and pull. I just simply let the machine go. You do not twist and turn. When you're doing a wing needle entredeau, you let the machine go. Can you look real closely and see how it goes forward? Let me slow down. Forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward and forward and backward. The needle has to hit in the same place. And this is true for wing needle entredeau on any machine that has this feature. So you must let the machine do all the work. You must not twist it. You must not try to turn it. And you must not try to line it up. You just simply guide it so the needle can go out there and do all of the work itself. Now, I'm gonna come on down on this particular, you remember I told you that we're going to just spray with that temporary adhesive, and I'm going to come down with my wing needle work right down to where I have sprayed on my motif. And then I'm going to stop sewing, and I'm gonna do my stop button so it will finish up in exactly one place. Okay, and then I'm going to cut it, lift it, and pull it away, and that has already been fixed, and then I'm going to go back after I do, if I've done my wing needle that far, then I'm going to back to go do my wing needle around all the edges where my motif is not, and then I will go back and just simply straight stitch all the way around the motif. And now I have a magnificent quilt square for you. I just love this beautiful quilt that we're having during the series and the square that we're going to do today is one of my favorite techniques and it was invented by Patty Jo Larson. It's the easy Madeira applique. This is the square I'm going to show you just exactly how to do. And by the way, we've used two fabrics here, a linen and a batiste and a linen for the center. Now it's a really easy technique when you know Patty Jo's technique, so let me just come and share that with you now. First of all, we've got to do the center section, so I'm going to trace off the little motif and I'm going to put some salvy behind it. I've got to have a lining. Then the next step is to simply stitch all the way around the little motif. Now there's a reason that that little, that little cross is there in the middle. After I've stitched all the way around it, I'm going to slice that little cross, cut a hole in it, and then I'm going to simply turn it right side out, which I've already done for you right here on this piece. Now the next step, let's go on to the uh, center part, to the big part that goes around. I'm going to use a water-soluble basting thread in the top only. Now you can put it in the bobbin, but you don't have to. You can use your regular thread in the bobbin, as long as you have the water-soluble in the top. With this method, we're going to fold the piece, which will go all the way around the square. We're going to fold it in half. I only mark half of the pattern. All right, I mark the pattern. Next step is to use the water-soluble basting thread and with a short stitch, about a 1.5 stitch length, I'm going to stitch all the way around here and then I will just cut it away. Now the next step you can see, after cutting it away totally, I'm going to come in and very carefully just clip the curves. You know, I've been clipping those curves for many years of sewing, and you just clip them straight in. Be sure you clip adequately in the middle, and then I'm going to turn it right side out. I have turned it right side out here. Can you see how beautiful that is? Now, the magic of that water-soluble basting thread is that I've got to first of all wet it because I want it to go away. So I dampen this either with a shot of steam from the iron or you can use spray starch or simply just dampen it a little bit. And then I press it completely dry. After it's completely dry, let me just show you some magic here. Now remember all I did was stitch it and turn it. And the magic is I'm going to go pull it apart like this and a perfect a perfect Madeira applique form is there. Look at there, it's already turned under for you. Is that easy or what? 
Now then, here it is after it's already been stitched. I, and then I'm going to show you a little bit about wing needlework in just a minute on the Madeira applique stitch. It's already been stitched. Here's a little decorative stitching. I stitched the Madeira applique stitch on my center motif, a little decorative stitching, and I've traced off where I'm going to put the silk ribbon embroidery. And now then, I would like to share with you a couple of tricks on the wing needle Madeira applique. It's called Madeira applique point de pari or pin stitch. First of all, on your stabilizer, sometimes it's really easy, and I do not do this sitting in my sewing machine. I don't want to get it on the machine, but you just spray it, spray a little of the temporary glue, the temporary spray adhesive on that, and it holds it completely in place, which really makes it a lot easier. It makes any sewing easier to kind of glue it down, I think. Now then, I'm going to come in. I have this set on my Madeira applique stitch, and I have it set on a 2.5 length and a 2.5 width. If you do not have a Madeira applique stitch, and by the way, I'm going to get my little shish kebab stick to hold it and guide it. If you do not have a Madeira applique stitch, all in the world you need to do is just use a tiny zigzag. Now, I am using a wing needle because I think it's really pretty to do Madeira applique with a wing needle. But you could use a 100, a 110, or a 120 top stitching needle. Or as I said, if you don't have the Madeira applique stitch, you can just do a tiny zigzag with just a regular needle. It is perfectly all right, and you don't have to have a fancy sewing machine to do all these wonderful uh, heirloom sewing techniques. I'm gonna simply slip around here to the corner. Now on turning a corner, if your machine does have a stop button, you press the stop button, the one stitch pattern, and it will stop exactly where it's supposed to. And I'm going to simply turn and then I will be ready to sew again. And I will have the perfect, the perfect place to turn. Now I do need to remove that stop button, don't I? Or I'll have the slowest sewing known to humanity. See how easy it is to do Madeira applique when you use the Patty Jo Larson easy way? I would now like to invite you to come to my attic where I have a really, really beautiful ladies dress to share with you. My friend Sue Houseman has loaned me another one of her beautiful pieces from her collection. This dress is absolutely fabulous. I, I imagine it's about 1910. It's made out of netting and this wonderful hem stitching. Of course, we do have machines that do the hem stitching now, but this would have been done one, on one of the ones a long time ago, the treadle machine. The ruffle netting is attached with hem stitching to a linen piece, and the collar is attached with hem stitching. Now let me lift up this and show you. Fascinating technique here. This is organdy over the netting. I've never seen anything quite like it. And of course, all of this is done by hand, this kind of curly little treatment around here. The sleeve is attached with hem stitching. The sleeve, by the way, is very interesting. Let me see if I can open it up to show you. It has those organdy pieces that have been inset on top of the netting and the hand, hem, the hand stitching, hand satin stitching, but it's really a heavy, heavy thread. I'm not even sure what it is. It's really very interesting. And now the belt has some of this organdy. And by the way, the organdy is a yellow. So the yellow organdy was used on white. The skirt is absolutely spectacular. I bet you could see it better if I would just hold it up a little bit. The skirt has these pieces. It almost looks like ocean waves. The yellow, very, very pale yellow organdy over the skirt, over the netting, and those beautiful, uh, well, we'll just call them ocean waves there. And then look at the tucks on the bottom of the skirt. There is a wide tuck, about a three inch wide tuck, three, maybe one eighth inch tucks and then the hem has been put in. You know, there's not one thing about this dress that wouldn't be absolutely spectacular to recreate on a garment for today. And I will tell you a little secret. I have known some ladies that have used the skirts of these women's dresses where the top was torn up and really couldn't be used. They've taken the skirts off and used them for skirts of a christening dress. Thank you for joining me in my sewing room today. I'd like to invite you back again next time.